All right. All right. Rethinking God with tacos with our guest, Thomas J. Ord, making a repeat performance here today. What an exceptional podcast. It was good. We dive into his book, Open and Relational Theology, which he sent. Uh, actually, he sent eight copies, one for me, I got one for you, and six for those who are going to be listening to this podcast. I believe this is our first ever Rethinking God with Tacos giveaway. Is it? I think so. Okay, so here, here's the rules. If you will go to iTunes and give a five-star review to this podcast <laughs> and write your comments in there, your glorious, glorious comments about how much you love Rethinking God with Tacos, <laughs> the first six people that do that and email us the proof, we will send you a free book of open and relational theology from Thomas J. Ord. And you are gonna want this book, yeah, man. That's right, and you're gonna send it to jason at afamilystory.org. Jason at afamilystory.org, and you're right, man. He's a brilliant scholar, uh, but this book, uh, it really does read in such a way that you're able to grab a hold of um, some things that are, I imagine will be new for some folks, but are grounded in the love of God revealed through Jesus as perfect theology. So, man, we talked about a lot of stuff. Well, I mean, the bottom line for me was we should avoid philosophies that can't help us talk coherently about love. <laughs> we should shun philosophies that make little or no sense of love. I love the way that he portrays a God who is love, who's engaged in our daily lives, and who we are cooperating with to create the future. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's a different view, and you know what? It fits with the model and the view of Jesus as perfect yeah. theology. Yeah, he made the statement that uh, by his mid twenties, as he was. Uh, pursuing uh, an education and pursuing ministry, uh, he became convinced that good theology placed love at its center. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's really awesome is, I mean, we dive into hell, evangelism, prayer, um, you know, the, the connection between leadership and the church. We talk about a lot of subjects, but we talk about it with love at its center. And, and he's really been revisiting all of those aspects of Christian faith uh, and revisiting them through the lens of relational and open approaches to how we think about God and his relationship to us. This is good, man. I, I think this is going to be helpful, uh, insightful. And um, uh, I was in over my head, but enjoying every second of it. Well, I'm a huge fan and I love his writing, but I think even more, I just love his heart for how to portray the God who is love and yeah. who wants our best and has our best interests at heart and is with us, cooperating, engaged. <laughs> He's relational. Yeah. He loves us. Yes. And um, you, if you have a view of God that's tough and doesn't make sense, I think your view will change in listening to this yeah. podcast yeah. and you will rethink a God who does makes sense because he is a God who is love. Yeah. And uh, Thomas does a great job of expressing that. It was a good conversation. It was a good conversation. Guys, send in those emails and uh, we'll get you these books. And uh, like, share, subscribe, retweet, you know, tell your mom, enjoy this podcast. I got a confession to make. Um, I've been out of town and and I've uh, been back a few days pushing towards a deadline. You sent eight of these, uh, open and relational uh, theology. Derek doesn't have his copy. Thanks, seriously. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Derek, there's a copy. I got one of these for you, man. After this conversation, <laughs> that'll be real helpful to you. But, uh, and I know you, you sent six to give away through this uh, podcast and the family story. So that's awesome, man. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, maybe we need to have a little, uh, a little contest on this particular podcast, uh, for somebody to write in and get a copy. Yeah. Uh, we'll figure that out along the way. But, um, Thomas, I, I have been diving into your Ort shorts. Oh, good on your podcast and i just have to say and and recommend these to all of our listeners if you'll get on uh itunes and all the places i think you can probably get there from your website as well but he has a little maybe uh three to five minute 
thought, open and relational thought, and it's called Ort Shorts. Um, and it's just brilliant. It is such a great a way to spend five minutes with understanding what is open and relational theology. Uh, and then you always uh, throw in a, a particular dynamic of something that is just so interesting and life-giving. Wow. And so I want to say thank you for that and recommend that to all of our listeners that they would uh, subscribe and like and uh, give a five-star review to Ort Shorts. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. I, I listen to lots of podcasts and, you know, I, I like long, long ones, but there's also something nice about, you know, if you're driving to the gym or to the store and you got five minutes, you bang on one of these things and, you know, it's over and done with. And <laughs> so that was kind of my vision in creating these three minute episodes. Well, my, my problem is I end up listening to about 15 of them. So I <laughs> on the whole catalog. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Again, good to have you back on the podcast. By the way, you you go by Tom in your emails. So not Dr. Thomas J. Ord, although you are. How about the right reverend, all-knowing, never makes any errors, <laughs> Tom Ord? <laughs> Come on. That's, your, that's his business card. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's on his business card. That's, right. <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> That's awesome. You're looking good, man. It's great to have you back. And it's been great to get to know you uh, since the last time we had John. I didn't know you as well the last time we had John, uh, beginning of, I think, uh, last year, our, our second season, the first time Derek and I did a podcast together. And um, uh, we've been following you since Derek's mentioned already uh, your short podcast. But um, man, I, I've been reading this uh, I, I know you've got a new book you're working on, and, and we can get to that. But I've been reading Open and Relational Theology, which has been out about, what, six months? Good. Yeah, it came out in July of 2021. Okay. Uh, you did a cover a cover uh, competition. You threw out three covers, you know, and you picked the one that I wanted. So. Oh, good. good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've been devouring this, man, and... Uh, I would love for you to just start off by a short introduction to the folks that maybe aren't familiar with you, uh, where you're out of, what you're doing. Um, you've written a whole lot of books. Uh, and then, man, let's dive into this thing. Because I also, I remember at the end of the podcast, you said, uh, I said I was a relational theologian. And you went, oh, oh, I got to tell you about this new book I got coming out, Open and Relational Theology. And I was like, oh my gosh, why didn't we talk about that? We got to do that next time you're on. So yeah, <laughs> introduce yourself and, uh, and let's dive in. Sure. Uh, my name is Tom or Thomas J. Ord's my full name. I live in Idaho. I'm a theologian at uh, Northwind Theological Seminary, and I direct a doctoral program in Open and Relational Theology. I also write a lot on science and religion, um, postmodernism, all kinds of other. I'm, I'm one of these people who has too many interests and dabbles everywhere. Um, but I would say sort of at the heart of my work and studies are the issues of love and open and relational theology. Yeah. And Thomas, why don't you, for the sake of our listeners, just give us a quick summary of what is open and relational theology? Great. That word relational refers to God as relational. Uh, that is, God not only gives, but also receives. God both influences creation and creation influences God. This is an idea that I think most people who read the Bible will probably think, well, uh, duh, that's the God of the Bible. Or if they've been around church long enough, they probably think, yeah, God hears my prayers. I may not understand what prayers are all about, but somehow God must be affected by what I do. Uh, and then they're surprised to discover that in the history of Christian theology, the major Christian theologians have denied that God is relational. People like Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, Martin Luther, John Calvin, they said, nope, God doesn't receive. God isn't affected. And relational theologians like me say, you got it wrong. We need to start and think differently. <laughs> the uh, openness part of it is a little more controversial. And it says that God moves through time like we do such that the past is really the past for God, and the future has not yet occurred. It's open. That's where the open word comes in. 
And so God is moving through time, moment by moment, interacting with us in creation. And probably the most controversial idea is that God knows everything that might happen in the future, but God does not know with certainty everything that's going to happen in the future. It's in the technical language, it's called exhaustive divine foreknowledge. Open and relational people reject exhaustive divine foreknowledge. Yeah, which introduces a lot of interesting questions for people. Yeah. Um, but those are questions that we like to talk about and discuss on Rethinking God because um, it has opened my eyes to an aspect that actually explains a God who truly looks more like Jesus. Mm, I think so too. And for me, that that helps bridge that gap. A lot of the thinking that comes out of open and relational theology um, is more in line with, you know, Jesus is perfect theology in terms of this is the view of the Father. This is the view of God. And so uh, you're actually diving into explaining that. But in the process, you're you're really striking against a lot of our Western philosophy and heritage that were handed to us and almost are taken, um, you know, without any thought, just accepted as truth. And you're challenging that. That's exactly right. Yeah. I think, you know, what I find happens is that a lot of people will grow up in a religious context. I'm a Christian, so I'll talk about the Christian context. They'll grow up in a Christian context and maybe it's an evangelical one and they'll have kind of a view of God who's kind of like either their big buddy in the sky or the policeman in the sky who's going to zap you if you step out of line. And we kind of imagine God is just kind of like a big body like ours. I mean, our body like ours, but just a lot bigger. And, um, and after a while, people start to realize that view doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, how is this God with a big body up in the sky supposed to hear every prayer or be influenced by everything on every universe. Um, how can this God be truly omnipresent, to use the classic language? Or, uh, you know, the God who's the policeman in the sky, it seems like you want to really be nice and hope you catch him on a good day if you step out of line. Otherwise, he's going to kick your butt. Right. And um, so I think a lot of people grow up with that view. They see how it's too much like humans. The word in theology is anthropomorphic. And they switch over to this idea that's kind of like God, who is the force in Star Wars. You know, it's God is not a, a relational agent. It's just there, like the glue of the universe. Um, Paul Tillich called this the ground of being. The problem with that view is that it's really hard to make sense of a loving God if this God isn't relational, isn't giving and receiving, isn't responding. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, a bunch in the West have that God, the force, rather than a personal agent. And what I and most open and relational folks want to say is that we can retain the view that God is really influencing the world and being influenced, and also that God is a universal spirit, so everywhere all at once. But in doing so, we're probably going to have to get rid of some of those what you called Western notions of God that have been so dominant for so long. Mm -hmm. I got to admit, I opened your book and went right to the end. Okay. <laughs> I went right for the ace card. All right. <laughs> which is what you describe uh, your, your chapter on love, uh, where you talk about your own personal journey into some of these, these thoughts and, and very much resonate with my personal journey, mm. which is, uh, you said by your mid twenties, I was convinced good theology placed love at its center. Mm. That relational thing seemed to be, um, the foundational uh, way by which you then began to look at things like Augustine. Uh, you have a section of ta talking about Augustine's God as a complete narcissist. <laughs> uh, and man, you articulate it so well, you know, we've had yeah. folks on, that talk about leadership in the church and narcissism being a huge issue today. And, and I often uh, think, man, part of the problem is we, we follow a narcissistic God. <laughs> uh, and there you, there you did, you laid it right down where some of those roots were found. That was fascinating. And then Nigren, is that how you pronounce it? 
Yes, Nigrin, yeah. Uh, Nigrin, and, and I, I was familiar with Agape and Eros, uh, but uh, man, you spoke very clearly on that, that it was the worst academic book on love in the 20th century, in your opinion. <laughs> I would love for you to speak to those, but I understand this relational dynamic, that God is love, that that is the foundation mm. for me. It's mm. the uh, Jesus came to reveal God you know, as a father and lived as an expression of, of a child of God, lived in the context of relationship. It was family. It was friendship. I no longer call you servant. I call you friend. Everything about what Jesus revealed was a relational God. Uh, the the open part uh, has has been the part that that I have been navigating since you yeah. said it to me a year ago. And mm. so I got this this question for you. OK, I played this game with my kid and I've told the story, so I'll race through it. We all play this with our kids. Eva, I love you to the trees and back, the sun, moon, and stars. And then she does what 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 kids do. She doubled that. She, I love you to the sun, moon, stars, <laughs> to to Jupiter, and, and we played this game, a measurement game that we played with our relationship based on how much we loved each other, and back and forth, back and forth, and finally I get to every creative way by which I can express my love, including infinity and beyond. To which then she gets clever and says, Daddy, uh, times two. Mm. She uses the smallest uh, denominator she can come up mm. with to double what I have uh, expressed to her, and it included infinity. So <laughs> so I, I am, I'm having this moment with my daughter where I feel this explosion in my heart as God speaks to me. He says, that is who I am. <laughs> I am a love that you can't measure even if yeah. you try, and it's fun to try. But that's who I am. As I was walking out of the room, my heart was exploding with this times two revelation of a measureless God that is love. For me, God is in time and outside of time. He's he's moving through it. He's the beginning, the end, the before, the after. Uh, and and that measureless revelation is the thing that that I'm in, invited to awaken to. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have this idea that God sits outside of time. That's what you're addressing, right? Yeah, I'm rejecting that idea. You're rejecting yeah. that idea. I, I, I need a little more clarity yeah. because for me, love is something that's outside of time uh, and that is also inside of time, that it's that God is moving in and through time. So help me help me get my heart around this. Help me get my head around this. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> uh, if we think of our own lives and the future as something that not yet exists, something that's a realm of possibilities, including what I have for breakfast tomorrow, where, you know, what team is going to win the Super Bowl Sunday, etc. Those things are just possibilities right now. None of them are actually existing yet because the future hasn't yet occurred. Now, if you were like me, and I guess you as well, if you think God is a God of love and God loves everyone all the time, God loves to the utmost in every moment of time that occurs. But there are some moments of time that have not yet occurred, and we wouldn't expect God to love in a moment that doesn't yet exist or hasn't yet happened. Um, right. Maybe maybe a better way to put it that's more, more visual John Calvin uh, believed God stood outside of time, and he used an illustration. Uh, he said, God is like the person who climbs to the top of a church bell tower. You know, in his day, that would be the tallest thing in the, in the, in the town. Sure. Chimes to the top of the church bell tower and looks down on the streets of the, of the village below. And let's assume there's a, a parade going on that's several blocks long. From that high perspective... God can see the beginning and the end of the parade all at once. He said, well, that's that's how God sees time. God sees it all at once because God is outside of it. God knows actually everything that's going to happen in our future and everything that happened in the past. Open to relational folks say, God's not up on the bell tower. God's actually in the parade. God's moving through time with us moment by moment, not watching us from a distance like Bette Midler's God, but they're present with us in time. And that means if God's in the parade, where the parade is going hasn't yet been determined yet. Now, when the parade goes where it goes, God will be there too. But those things that have not yet occurred 
are haven't yet occurred. And so God can't be there yet. I'm so I'm tracking with you. Okay. <laughs> and it resonates with me because I, I do think the, the way that you describe that God is from a distance outside and, and there's yeah. no distance, no separation in the nature of love. He's, he's with us in this moment. This is the thing I'm trying to wrestle with. If God is a measureless revelation of love, yeah. I, I've said this before, I am here right now with you guys. But I also believe because of the nature of love, I'm also in the cloud of witnesses. Because of the nature of love, I am, I am both here. This is what I know to be real, to be, to be the, the day in, day out expression. But I'm also awakening to this measureless nature that is the love of God, that is not constrained to a beginning or an end, but is flowing uh, throughout history. So I, I guess I'm wrestling with how to put all that together. Yeah. What does it look like for God to be with me, but to any... also be awakening to it? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you have any children by chance? Yeah, I do. I have three. Okay. Do you mind my asking their ages? They're stepping into adulthood. I've got a 22, 20, and then a 15-year-old. Okay. Would you say that at this moment, you love your 40-year-old children? Absolutely. I don't think you would. I don't think your children are 40 yet, so they're not yet there to love. <laughs> <laughs> now, you might love the idea yeah, yeah. of your children. <laughs> I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, yeah, but I would also say, yeah, I do love them. I, I, because of the nature of love, there would be nothing that would step outside of that. I don't, I don't love them in this, in that time because that time hasn't happened yet. Does that make sense? That's my point right there. That last point is my point. I got you. I, I would say, hopefully as a loving father, when they turn 40, you'll love them then. Sure. So it's your intent, uh, to love them when you're, when they're 40. But they're not yet 40. And so you can't say, I you technically can't say, I love my 40 year old children. Um, you love them where they are in this moment. Sure. That's how I think of God as well. God, unlike you, I think God's got an eternal nature of love. But um, the future hasn't yet occurred. I got you. Um, and there's another issue here. And maybe, maybe this is, a, I should have gone this way instead. <laughs> Let me let me pull out the Bible on you here. Let hey. me go Bible boy. Hey, we like the Bible. <laughs> Imagine if you think God is truly outside of time. Would it make any sense to say God began creating? No. A God who's timeless doesn't begin to do anything. Would it make sense to say a timeless God forgives our sin? Well, not a forgive means respond to something that happened what we did, because that God doesn't respond. God's outside of time. So many words in the Bible that talk about what God does start with the letters R-E. Responds, repents, repays, re-re. All that re stuff assumes a moment in time in which God wasn't doing it, and then God somehow reacted. But a timeless God can't react. Timeless God just is. So sort of the bottom line, so much of what we read about God in Scripture is undermined if you think God is perfectly timeless. Right. I'm, I'm tracking with you. Uh, Jason is getting ready to rock some awesome string theory for all of us here today. <laughs> I love it. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, no doubt. One of the things that you said that really resonated with me is we should avoid philosophies that cannot help us talk coherently about love. We should avoid philosophies that make little or no sense of love. And for me, the the you know as a follower of Jesus, uh, I would say one of the most powerful philosophies that makes sense of love is a God who would become His creation, a God who would become one of us to. Mm-hmm enter death and, and help us come out of our blindness. Um, and in that case, you know, and obviously we've, you know, we've looked at that in the past that, well, this God, he stepped into time in the yeah. nature of Jesus, but, but the way you're saying it, which I really am resonating with, because this kind of is a more, uh, more of a philosophy of becoming co-creators and co-laborers with God yes. in the process of, creating the future. Yes, definitely so. But it's wrapped up in in Jesus. For me, it's wrapped up in Jesus as this 
well, this is not, that's my philosophy of love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is the God that would become one of us. Yeah. I like that. I mean, I also believe God is specially incarnated in Jesus. Um, it's always interesting to work out what aspects of Jesus we think reflect who God is and what aspects we don't. Like, you know, I think Jesus is the best revelation of God's character of love that we have, the, yeah. the definitive revelation, I'm even yeah. willing to say. Yeah. But, you know, Jesus wasn't omnipresent. He wasn't everywhere all at once, for I think God is. Yeah. Jesus didn't know everything that was knowable. That's why he asked a lot of questions like, who touched me? And things like that. Yeah. I think God knows everything that's knowable. So when it comes to Jesus, we have these interesting questions. What aspects of Jesus do we think correspond with God and which aspects are different? I think the idea that Jesus experiences time moment by moment fits with the idea of a God who experiences time moment by moment. But a lot of classical theologians have had a timeless God who interjected into history in the form of Jesus, experienced time in some mysterious way, both timeless and timeful, you might say, and then zaps right back out of history and is timeless again. Uh, I think it's much more coherent to have a timeful God experiencing moment by moment and a timeful Jesus experiencing moment by moment. It brings an interesting and age old philosophical question as to what is kenosis? What is that he emptied himself, mm. you know? Um, yeah. In, in Philippians where it talks, he emptied himself of his, that, that ability or that divine God-like aspect. Yeah. And yet he was still fully God in the flesh. Um, you know, I mean, my personal atonement theory is that God smuggled himself into death to blow it up from the inside out. Ah. And therefore, destroyed love destroyed death um, because the God who could not die had to enter into death by becoming flesh. And so, I mean, that's that's kind of how I I wrestle with that and see that. Um, and it was is to bring us out of a, a state of blindness as to yeah. his goodness, his presence, not necessarily to um, receive punishment for some cosmic right. wrong that was done. I like your atonement theory. It makes a lot of sense. And that's why I think this open relational thinking for me is so embraceable um, because it's uh, it's very inclusive. It's very inclusive with it doesn't it doesn't separate who's in and who's out. Yes. And I think the moment we start making those decisions, we really have transcended God. Definitely. Right. And, and tried to come into our own thinking of, well, I know, I know what God would know here because that person's in, that person's out. Yep. And that's when, to me, that's where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. When I find a, 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 a tribe like yours of these open and relational thinkers, um, I see an inclusivity that loves humanity, that lo loves, loves everyone the most. <laughs> yep. That's beautifully put. And that's so true for open relational thought. Um, so many other religious, well, I'll just say theological traditions has to have an us and them has to have, you know, the elect and the non-elect has to have uh, those people God favors and those God doesn't. Um, I don't know what your guys' personal view on hell is. So forgive me if I'm going to cause, turn a, a the apple cart upside down. Go for it. But I don't believe in a God who sends people to hell. I just don't think that makes sense. If you start with a God of love who loves everyone all the time, you don't, you're not going to have God sending anyone to eternal conscious torment. Now there's some other options on the table. One option is annihilationism. I'm not really attracted to that view. Uh, in my view, annihilationists have a God who kind of gives up on some people, who gives them 3,000 chances, but not 3,001. Um, or you can go kind of a classical uh, universalism, Karl Barth, David Bentley Hart, those sort of, sorts of folks. They retain a view of God's power such that God either forces everyone into heaven at the end or creates us all at the beginning such that we'll eventually end, all end up in heaven and no matter what we do. To me, that view sort of discounts what we do here and now. Like if I know everyone's going to heaven eventually, why should I make any sacrifices in the present? Why not just 
be, live for my own pleasure, knowing everything is going to work out all right at the end. So my own view says this. God always loves everyone all the time in this life and the next. We can always say no to God's love in any moment. And when we do, well, there are natural negative consequences from saying no to love because love wants well-being. So the opposite is ill-being. So saying no Uh to well-being means ill-being for ourselves or for others. So in my view, God relentlessly pursues in this life and the next. God doesn't, in fact, can't force anyone to say yes to love. But that means there's no guarantee that everyone will eventually say yes. I've got the real hope. God never gives up. So there's the possibility that universal reconciliation will occur, but not because of God's omnipotent power to come in and, you know, make sure everybody goes. It's that God will eventually winsomely lure and woo everyone to a love relationship. Yeah, that's so so good. I couldn't get more on board with that. I I actually uh, recently kicked out of a place for this one thought. If God is a relentless love in this life, Why wouldn't it be the same in the next? Great. Yeah. If if love looks like reconciliation at a cross, and that is the nature of love, then uh, I'm wide open to the idea that God continues to be a relentless redeemer uh, on the other side, as you said. Preach it. And that definitely got me in trouble. Now, what did your opponents worry about there? Well, like they did, they say, hey, you know, that Jason, he doesn't have a God who, you know, kicks butt or like they want consequences or uh, they don't want Hitler in heaven or what was it? Oh, that's probably a mixture of all of those. The uh, re- retributive perspective on the nature of God. That at the cross, God turned his back. Hell is a necessity. It's a punishment. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Jason, if I might be so bold as to inject a thought as to why that was as well, um, knowing a little bit about the situation, uh, it's also a very literal reading of the Bible. Um, And it's a very uh, worshipful um, consideration for the Bible, which on this podcast, what we say is we love the word of God and we like our Bibles too. (laughs) That's good. You know, I I hear exactly what you're saying. And when you start drilling down to uh, the need for hell, then you start really getting at the nature of God and the nature of love. And I think for me, what upset the apple cart, in fact, I, I actually... I think I may have burned the entire apple wagon down completely. (laughs) Um, Was that if for 90 or so years of, of an evil life lived, turning your back on God deserves a punishment that is uh, God miraculously keeping you alive with your nerve endings working well, burning in your own fat for eternity then personally, I don't want anything to do with that guy. Exactly. <laughs> I'm totally with you. Why would I want to embrace that God? And and yet people will say, well, you don't get to decide what God is like. I said, no, God revealed who he was like in Jesus. That's right. And I do not see that in in him or in his nature. And then I think the other, other thing that I love that you're getting at is that there is still this free will, and yet, there's an irresistible nature to love that probably will, and my hope is, yeah, that's it. And my hope is aligned with God's hope that all will be saved. I mean, we read that in the scriptures. It is His will that all be saved. Why wouldn't we align our own will with that and say, yeah. "Hey, I don't know for sure, but I, I really hope so. I really hope so. I hope love is so irresistible and so much more powerful than even death that all." shall be saved. And that's, uh, you know, I, I could be wrong. I might be wrong. I mean, we may get to heaven. God's like, yeah, Derek, here's why I'm totally down with eternal conscious torment. <laughs> in that case, I'm leaving heaven with you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> at yeah. that point, I guess I'd be looking love in the face and I'd be saying, oh, okay, well, that you have a great reason that I never considered before. But no, I don't no. have to believe that. I think that is part of the sticking point that Jason's leadership was dealing with is that 
Well, you have to believe this in order, or you don't believe any of it. And also, I would say we live in a, a broken world. There's so much injustice in this world. And, uh, and people are looking for justice, but they have a, a retributive perspective on justice. Uh, the church has a retributive, a punitive perspective on justice. And, and so the idea that hell doesn't exist when you think justice is about punishment is a scary thing because— Well, even the justice thing, let's—I'm with you. I don't think hell is about retributive justice. But just let me put myself in that sort of perspective just for a moment eternal conscious torment doesn't fit the crime of 90 years of sin. So it's not even just from that perspective. Right. Now people will say, well, it's, it deserves an eternal punishment because it's an, it's an eternal sin against God. Then I start thinking, so in other words, you just throwing that word eternal around left and right. It doesn't make, it's, it's a, it's an equivocation to use my philosophical language. It's an equivocation. Like it means forever in the afterlife, but when it means a sin against God, it doesn't mean forever. Like I'm not forever sinning against God. So there's all kinds of weird twists and, you know, uh, word games that go on. If we start with love, which sounds like all three of us want to do that, we're going to move away from a lot of those doctrines. We're going to move away, I think, and this may begin, we're all in agreement on this, or maybe this is controversial. We're going to move away from any notion of a punishing God. I have lots of scholar friends who think that divine punishment can be character formation so that God might punish us because God wants us to improve in some ways. And there's always a hint of truth in the notion that we learn from our mistakes. And so it's nice to sort of expand that out and say, well, God, you know, sent that bad thing to teach you a lesson to make you better. The problem if you go down that path is that then you have to start asking your question, everything that happens, it's negative. Did God allow this to teach me a lesson? Um, and that just, I, I think, creates a whole lot more problems than it helps. Instead, I would like to say, God doesn't, quote, cause or allow evil, but God works with whatever happens, even the painful, and tries to squeeze something good from it, despite not wanting it in the first place. If you go that route, if you have a God who can squeeze good from evil, then you don't have to blame God for the evil in the first place, but you can get the character formation, development, learning a lesson sorts of stuff out of that theology. And your love is revival. You the hey guys, I'm interrupting this podcast for just a minute so I can invite you to partner with us by giving to a family story. A family story is a 501, a nonprofit, and it's our ministry. And it's what allows for me to produce this podcast and other regular content. We've been living this faith journey for a long time, but 2014 was when we officially stepped away from the traditional pastoring approach to full-time ministry. It's been fun. This journey has been wild. And this last year was no less faith-inducing with COVID affecting travel and speaking. And it's been good because, hey, we started a podcast. Our passion is to create content catalytic for an encounter with the always good, transforming, reconciling love of our Heavenly Father. And so our heart through this ministry has always been that through speaking, writing, film, and music, we're relentlessly sharing the goodness of our Father, the good news. Your giving goes directly to support this podcast, as well as written content, discipleship content, teaching small group messages, articles that we release weekly, and also the book I'm writing. I'm excited about what I'm chasing down right now. We appreciate all the support, whether it's sharing, writing a review, following us, signing up for our email list, or financially. We just love being on the journey with you. If you want to give to A Family Story, you can go to afamilystory.org, afamilystory.org, and click on the Give button. All right, thanks, guys. Let's get back to the podcast. Wow. I actually came to a point in my personal life as not just a pastor for the last, you know, 18 years and in ministry for even longer, having grown up on a steady diet of this retributive nature of God. And yet yeah. when my uh, first wife was killed by a drunk driver, she was seven months pregnant mm. and I was at the scene and 
you know, experienced this trauma. And the context and the faith community that I was in, in no way would assign God as the cause of that accident. But there was a hint of, well, it passed through his hands, you know, and therefore he knew that you could handle it. And I finally came to a very honest evaluation of my own existence to say, well, I don't care if he caused it or if it passed through his hands, if he has that kind of power and this, this was allowed, I don't want anything to do with that guy. That's good. I reject that guy. Exactly. I reject Preach it, brother. That's right. And so therefore now my mind began to be open to uh, new views of, of God. Cause I didn't see him in that way. I didn't attribute the, the cause and effect. And I think Jesus did this in many, many cases as well. I remember in, in the questioning of the, the blind, this man is born blind. Whose sin was it? Who caused it? And in one translation, it kind of gives the sense of Jesus saying, there is no cause and effect. Let me show you what love will do. Yeah, right. Love brings sight to the blind. Yeah. And so um, I began to embrace, I believe. Can I insert there real quick? Yeah. In the Greek, in that story, there's no word that English translators usually put because, like this happened because or so that God is going. In the Greek, there's no word. Wow. Right. The English translators have jammed that in, that cause and effect there, and have just totally screwed that up to make us think that everything is for a reason. Yeah. yeah. I like your translation. Of, of, of the reasons why I came out of a thinking about an all controlling God and a God who is love and is cooperating with us on a daily existence um, and, and overcoming evil with good. And then, you know, then you get into the origins of evil. I don't even want to go down that track. I believe evil is generated. It's not generated from God. Yeah. I believe, you know, the God, the God who gave a commandment, thou shalt not kill. Why would he be the God that kills? Right. <laughs> that's, just, that's just a short, a short version. But I guess, I guess the thing that I want to know is, how do we help people come yeah. into a revelation and an understanding of the things that you guys are, are tackling in your open and relational theology? What, what is a, a practical way? And I, I know cooperation with the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's, there's the spiritual Holy Spirit element of knowing how to reach that person with the love of God. And so we can always trust that. But Maybe, maybe some ideas from you on how you've seen people come into this way of thinking and, yeah. and rejecting the God well, in, that is Zeus-like. Yeah. In this book that we've been mentioning called Open Relational Theology, uh, the whole book is written in a very accessible way. I like to say I wrote it so my mother can understand it. But in the opening sections, I give about 10 different reasons why people come to this particular perspective. And, you know, some of them, they're asking the big kind of questions we've been discussing here. Some of them have this commitment to Jesus's love, and they think this way of thinking best meshes with that. Others are sort of in the social sciences or medicine, and they think, oh, hold on a second. If it's loving for us to say, or if we think that child abuse is not loving, then we should have a God who's not into child abuse. So they sort of have that kind of analogies running from their own uh, particular disciplines. Other people, you know, come at it from very philosophical kinds of language, like, you know, what's a perfect being like? And they come to an open relational view. Uh, some just sort of have the big themes of love and scripture that line them toward this perspective. Others uh, have like a tragedy, like you mentioned, Derek, and they start reasoning their way through, okay, what's God's role in this and yeah. what really makes sense? And open and relational thought, I think even its, its critics would, would agree, has the best answer to the questions of suffering in the world. I agree. Yeah. So there's all these different avenues that people come to open and relational theology through. Once they get there, they find out that open and relational thought is diverse. We don't all have the exact same ideas on everything. But what we share in common is this God of perfect love, who's yeah. not controlling, who's really giving and receiving, who is engaged moment by moment. And um, that view of ultimate reality that we call God makes so much sense to so many people. Some people, in fact, often, 
when I'm speaking at a university or a conference or a church, I'll get done and somebody will come up to me and they'll say, ah, finally someone talked about God in a way that I've always kind of thought was probably right. It fit my intuitions, but they will say to me, I didn't have the words to articulate Mm. it. And I think that's, that number of people is growing and growing and growing. And hopefully this open and relational theology book will help in that way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's a huge deal to be putting language around uh, something for folks. And I'm grateful to you for it. And, and it is a book. Um, that book was written for me and your mom, your mom and me. <laughs> and I, 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 I try and play ball with you scholars and I, I can't, I can't, I can't grab a hold of the words and remember them long enough, but <laughs> my journey has been one where I've gotten there through love um, and through that being, uh, you know, the first time that I heard the phrase uh, relational theologian, I embraced it. I went, oh my yeah. gosh, finally, someone put language. It seems right. <laughs> someone yeah. put language to what, what it is that I am. And, and yet, um, we're in the process, you know, and we're in a moment in time where there's, like you said, so many people, we have this movement right now called deconstruction taking place, uh, where so many people, I think, are on this journey that you're talking about, uh, navigating uh, the, the, yeah. the, the disconnect between what they know to be true when they play that love game with their kids mm-hmm. and what they're, what they're taught through, uh, this perspective on God or this perspective on God from pulpits and, and, uh, and yep. schools. Um, and one of the things that I really love, I, the book I'm writing is, is, is called leaving and finding Jesus. And nice. And the reason I'm, I I'm running at that is because it's, uh, it's hopefully helping put language for those that think like me that are more relational, uh, put language around some of the broken ideas we've had about the nature of God while realizing that as you go on this journey of leaving and and so many are, you're going to rediscover that that a God that never leaves. And Oh, by the way, I'm like you, I believe his his name is Jesus. And I believe Mm -hmm. as Derek says that that when we deconstruct, we get down to the cornerstone that is Jesus. And, and, and what I appreciate that that you're running at, uh, because there's so many at this point who are in the leaving part and, 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 and they're throwing it all out. And what I love is that you're you're giving us some of these things like prayer, you know, mm. some of the questions that get raised when you start to go down these roads. Do I need what is prayer about? What is the prophetic? Like, what does that mean? What is and I appreciate that you've you've done some work in this book as well and hit some of those subjects. But I would love for you to walk down some of those traditional Christian disciplines and how they fit still within this open relational approach yeah. uh, to God. Um, boy, since I have been a person who has rethought my entire theology around these ideas, it's hard for me to know where to begin. <laughs> but since you mentioned prayer, yeah, yeah it's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Since you mentioned prayer, let me, uh, let me go with that. We've talked, we talked about hell already. That's right. Yeah. Let's do prayer. <laughs> um, I think it's easiest for me to sort of work on the prayer issue uh, by comparing my view to three other models. That way, folks who are hearing this kind of maybe they can pick out in their own experience these other ways of thinking and and maybe they reject some of them like I do. Okay. Um, So model number one, we'll call it the Calvinist model. It says God sovereignly predestined everything from the foundations of the earth. Now, if that's true, then I just can't get motivated to pray at least a petitionary prayer. Because petitionary prayer is asking God to do something. But if it's already been predetermined, everything in the future, then like it makes no sense for me to ask God to do something different than what God has already done. Right. Most Calvinists I know don't actually pray like God predestined everything. In other words, their 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 piety, their religious practice doesn't match their theology. <laughs> Most Calvinists, they pray like the second model. These people think that God can fix things single-handedly and sometimes does, but prayer functions kind of like 
begging and pleading for God to get off his butt and fix something. So God is on the sideline saying, okay, Derek, you got to pray 28 times before I'm going to lift a finger. You know, Jason, you don't have, you've got 67% of faith. You got to get up in the upper eighties before I'm going to move. Um, in this kind of approach, it's hard to imagine God being perfectly loving because we somehow have to earn things. Right. And if God is smarter than you and me and loving and can do anything God wants, can single-handedly fix problems, why would I get motivated to pray? Because God really is the one who knows what's best, and a loving God would do what's best even if I didn't ask. So what's the role of petitionary prayer? People who look at those first two models oftentimes see their inadequacies and then go to a third model. It says this, prayer doesn't change God. It only changes me. Yeah. Now, I think prayer does change me, but I think we ought to talk about how prayer really makes a difference to God, to me, and to the world. So the fourth model that I want to suggest that assumes God is uncontrolling, assumes God is relational, and here's the openness stuff is going to really matter. So (laughs) it's going to come in pretty uh, deeply. It says this, when we pray, we have an effect on God. God has new information, new relational data. Something new emerges in a particular moment for God that wasn't available in the previous moment. And because God is affected by what we do and we live in an interrelated universe, God takes whatever happens in one moment and responds by acting in a particularly different way, always loving, but different way of love in the next moment. In this particular model, I'm not saying our prayers make it so that God could control in the future. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that our prayers in this model actually make a difference to God and to what happens in the future. The future is open. It can still be shaped by what we do and how God acts. And in my way of thinking, that makes petitionary prayer really valuable and helpful, Um, especially the kind of petitionary prayers in which I pray for God's help in things that I have a contribution to make. Um, you know, I'm, I frequently pray in the mornings and ask God for wisdom on how to spend my day. And I might think about things that are coming up in the day that I think might be challenges. And um, I ask for insight and in how to respond to those challenges. Um, and I think that In asking and being vulnerable in that way, I think my prayers have an effect on God. They have an effect on me. And my day can be different because I prayed. Again, it doesn't make God a controlling God, but it's new information for God to work with. Yeah, wow. What do you think of that? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Thomas. I like that. I do. I like that a lot. One one thing that comes to my mind is... um, First of all, it's relational in that there's communication. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, even in our our human relationships, when I sit across the table with someone at a meal and they begin to open up to me or ask for help, uh, that that creates information that I now have that I want to allow love to come into that. I, I see that person in a different light. I see that person in a more loving light. Yes. It's kind of like the more you get to know someone, the, it's like, okay, that I understand now, you know, why I thought they were such a jerk. Well, they've had this horrible experience or you begin to be relational and it opens the realm of love even further of being known and knowing. Um, I love that. I absolutely love that. And th- the other thing that's coming to my mind, just to kind of go back to some of your thoughts about, people coming at this from so many different angles. When Jesus said in my father's house are yeah. many rooms, you know, and, and that's good. Yeah. Whatever room you're in, you're still in the house, but maybe you're in the room that's grappling with this, this type of situation, or you came in through this route. And it doesn't mean that all paths, you know, lead to God. I believe Jesus is truly the way, the truth and the life. And yet anyone seeking truth is going to bump into Jesus and and That's hopefully it. experiencing yeah. experience that irresistible love. 
Um, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, I love it. I, I love the way that you can put words to some of these things. And, and when we run it kind of through the open and relational, um, filter, it just starts making so much more sense. Yeah. Cool. I do too. I, the way that I navigate this world and God has always been when I hear something that I don't understand or that I, or, or scares me or unnerves me or is new, I, um, I, I step right back into what is a good father like? What is the dynamics between the relationship between a father and a mm. child? How can I apply what you just gave me in that context? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I suddenly go, oh, yeah, of course. Of course, this is how it would interact, just like what, what Derek said, you know, uh, as a father myself, you know, there's the connection with my kids and the moment I'm aware to, uh, aware of something even more or more nuanced or, or they mature into another place and I only know it because of the interaction we have and how they speak. And I realize, oh, they've matured into a new place of understanding. They have more, yeah. uh, more ability by which I can now speak to them. They have a larger language, a, a bigger grasp of this. I can give them more. All of those dynamics that work yeah. in the context of what you're saying uh, ring very true for me. Just uh, again, coming back to that good, good theological approach through the lens of family, which is what Jesus did. Called him dad, always called him dad. Yeah. Uh, that father and parent thing, I think, is so true. In, in this open and relational book, I try to capture this yeah. by talking about playing soccer with my three daughters. Yes. You know, yeah. I love my kids. I want to help them. I want to love them in the very best I can at any moment. Now, when they were younger and we were out on the soccer pitch or mostly in my backyard, I played very gingerly. I didn't kick the ball very hard because they were young. And that right. was the most loving thing to do then. Yeah. But when they got in high school and they could outrun their old man, you know, <laughs> I was using all my old man tricks, body checking them, throwing my <laughs> weight around. Why yeah. was I doing that? Because I wanted to imp help them improve. I loved yeah. them just as much when they were older. Just I changed my style of play to match where they were That's at. That's beautiful. I think God's love is steadfast. God always loves. That'll never change. However, the forms and expressions of God's love change moment by moment, depending on the person and the circumstances, the needs and the situation. And so God has both a dimension of unchanging love and a dimension of changing love. I love that, man. I do. I read that. That was what I just finished reading when we when we got on here. So good. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Oh, good. Mm, yeah. I, I, again, that's how you do it for me. That's how you how you explain the nature of God and His relationship to us. And uh, I don't have all the yeah. all the. I'm grateful to you for unpacking it through all of the academic and scholarly yes. ways as well. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Well, thanks. Sometimes. Oh, can I throw in one more little sort of sort of a little jab <laughs> um, the way so many theologians and I'll call it conventional theology, the way so much conventional theology portrays God as a parent, as a loving parent, like that's a crappy parent. Like yeah. so much of conventional theology says things like, God doesn't cause mm -hmm. evil, but allows evil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what kind of loving parent do you know allows, I don't know, a rapist to come in the house yeah. and screw with the yeah. kids if they could right. stop yeah. them? But a conventional God has to say God allowed yeah. that. That's not a loving father. That's not a loving parent. Yeah. So if yeah. we start with that loving parent, and there's going to be some disanalogies, but if we start with a loving parent, that can help us overcome a lot of the obstacles conventional or classical theologies have presented to us. <laughs> I've been doing it right the whole time. That's what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I love That's it. Awesome. By the way, Jason, you're in my new book. Really? Your book, uh, Prone to Love? Yes, sir. Didn't that's in a footnote in my a new book on pluriform love. So yeah, I was wow. reading that. But this is a good book. I gotta gotta give some credit to you. Oh wow, I love it. Wow, thank you. I, I'm I'm honored. I uh, that that um, that that value for humanity is a huge thing, right? That that idea that uh, that we are actually created in His image and likeness. Big transformative. Yes. Uh, 
and of course, that whole book's about the nature of our our, our sonship or our daughtership in the connection with our father. So, yeah, man, that's yeah. an that's an honor. Wow, cool. Yeah, um, I I had a question for you, but you just you just blew oh, my sorry. socks off. You busted <laughs> with that. knocked you off track. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have, I remember. I I just wanted to say I know we're we're, we're working toward an hour, so oh, okay. I, I, I sometimes we ask this question. Um, I know you're writing a new book right now. What? I, but if I were sitting across the table from you, we're having coffee, or better yet, tacos, which you can feel free to dive <laughs> in on that as well, because that's what we would be doing. We'd be having tacos, and 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 I said, what is the one thing that's burning in you? right now um what's the one thing you just got to tell us uh what would it be Oof. <laughs> and what is... kind of taco are you eating while you tell me this <laughs> well you know there's a place where i like to eat tacos here in town we call it the taco bus and it's more than just a place you go and stand outside you actually sit in the bus while you eat tacos and Amelda is the woman who makes them. They're absolutely fantastic. She's got these pickled <laughs> pickled peppers that I just really love. Uh, Come on. Let's see. What's burning in me? Mm. Well, I don't know if this is burning, but this is the thing I was thinking about this morning. I was reading the passage uh, in Luke chapter two, I think it is. Maybe it's chapter five, whatever. It's the story of which the disciples are fishing and, you know, they throw their nets on the other side and Jesus in eventually says, come, I want to make you fishers of men. Yeah. And I've been thinking about how in my own life's journey, I have gone from thinking that being an evangelist, a fisher of men, meant that I needed to go door to door and be with Campus Crusade for Christ and witness to people on airplanes and tell them the right sets of belief. And if they didn't have those right sets of belief, then they weren't part of the club. And there was even a time which I'd say to my Catholic friends, you just aren't Christians because you don't have the right set of, you're following the Pope and you're, right. you know, whatever. Um, and how much I thought of evangelism kind of like, uh, either a car salesman right. hmm. or a get out of jail kind of attempt. Like, I really don't want you to go to hell. And I know God's going to send you there if you don't say the sinner's prayer. So let me get you on your knees so you can say that prayer. That's how I understood evangelism, fishing for people. Now, oh, and then I went to a second stage, which was like, I realized love ought to be in part of it, but I kind of still had the same mode in mind. I still thought the end goal was avoiding hell. It's just that I was going to try to be as loving as I could in getting people to say the prayer. So instead of having like a, you know, kamikaze, you know, militant evangelism, I was going right. to be gentle, kind, show an yeah. example of love, but had basically the same message I was trying to get people to buy into. And so I've been thinking today about what it means when love is both the method and the message. Hmm. What does it mean to not only lovingly present the gospel, but the gospel is love? Mm -hmm. And I think the implications mean that we rethink the afterlife. It means that we can have hope that people yeah. who outright reject my message right now might later come to accept it. Um, it means that a loving God is not just relying upon me to get the message out there, but is present to all creation at all times. And like it, if I start with a loving God, who's a universal spirit, always acting open and relational, the message and the method change pretty dramatically than what it used to be when I was with Campus Crusade for Christ and was a gung-ho evangelist. That's awesome. That's great, Tom. That's, yeah. I mean, it just makes me think. In that statement, when Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men, is basically he was saying, hey, guys, you're going to be the love lures. Ah, <laughs> that's nice. The lure especially works good there. <laughs> and as, you're tra as you're transformed into my image and becoming more like me, then you're getting better at loving people well. That's good, Derek. Uh, yeah. All right, Derek, I'm going to...
I'm going to footnote you in my sermon Sunday morning. I, I was going to say, <laughs> I was going to say you could use that. I, uh, I, Derek, <laughs> can he use that? He can use like, that. like Jason. I'm always fishing for a footnote. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> I love uh, it. Hey, Thomas, this has really, really been an exceptional time with you. I'm going to recommend that our listeners buy your books and yep. engage yep. with open and relational thinking and theology. Um, they can do so at no cost to themselves by checking out your Ort Short uh, podcasts. I mentioned it earlier, but it's a three to five minute podcast that uh, Thomas puts out that I've been through the whole the whole of them. I mean, I just keep them going in my car. And it's such an exceptional cool. way to get introduced to open and relational theology. Cool. I believe your heart will sing and resonate with uh with the love that you believe god really is and um that's what it's done for me and so um thank you for what yeah. you do and what yeah. you carry yeah. uh yeah. it's an honor to have you on this podcast with us today and i want to sit on yeah. that taco bus with you <laughs> yes and, <laughs> i and, love and it eat tacos made by what's her name Imelda. 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 Oh, man. Imelda, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Thanks for the opportunity for the chat. I really, I've enjoyed oh, it a lot. It's an honor. Honor. We're excited about giving some of these books away to the audience, and we'll Good. talk about that on the front end. But real quick before we step away, um, website, social media, all of that stuff, where do we find you? I have a personal website that's my full name, Thomas J J A Y Ord O O R D dot com. But if you're interested in open and relational thought and you want to kind of find more resources, I direct the Center for Open and Relational Theology. And that website is the letter C, the number four, O R T dot com. I, I recommend that to you. Awesome. Wonderful, man. We'll, we'll make sure that's all available to everybody. Thanks again, man. We'll do this again, I'm sure, but uh, honored to have you on. This was incredible. My honor. Hey, guys, we're so glad that you are joining us for Rethinking God with Tacos. Uh, you can find me, Derek Turner, at rivercharlotte.com. That's my church. And I'm on all the social medias yes. as Pastor Derek T, D E R E K, Pastor Derek T. Yeah, and uh, he's a Twitter savant, you gotta follow him on Twitter. I'm also on Twitter uh, at Jason Clark is, uh, and you can find all of these podcasts, including season one, on all of the platforms: Apple, uh, Spotify, Spotify uh, all the places. All the places. You can also go to afamilystory.org, and everything's there. If you sign up for our mailing list, we send out a weekly email that has uh, articles, podcast information, and uh, we also let you know about new books coming out or events that we're uh, connected to. So yeah. uh, like, share, retweet, and uh, and man, if you could write a review, it actually does something for the rankings. It, it, it does, it yeah. Available, so. But a five-star review, of course. <laughs> yes. You know, if you can't write a five-star review or something, <laughs> Like just don't even write don't, a review. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like if you can't say something nice, don't say anything, don't say at, anything all. at all. I, I like that, and then apply that to this <laughs> podcast. Definitely, that's my motto. That's I like what I do. I love it. So love you guys. Appreciate you coming on the ride with us. God bless. <laughs>